thank you all for making time to take part in this virtual uh, panel in the middle of conflicting uh, travel schedules and right before Labor Day and with COVID rearing its ugly head. Uh, it's really excited that we could get you all on a call. Um, in lieu of introductions, I'm just going to go ahead and jump into our first question that will include those introductions. So on the panel, we have Julia Hinckley, who is the Director of Policy in the Mayor's Office for the City of Philadelphia. And Julia, you were previously, as part of this work, the Director of Policy for Health and Human Services in Philadelphia. We have Mitch Little, who is the Executive Director of the Office of Community Empowerment and Opportunity in Philadelphia which is the city's community action agency, and Rachel Eisenberg, the director of the Office of Criminal Justice. I go through those introductions, not just to make sure people know um, who's talking to them, but also to note that none of you are judges. None of you work for a parking authority. None of you work for a DA's office. Nothing in your job description um, captures fines and fees. So what made you interested in this work? Well, I can I can start. Well, I do have um, I do have policy in my title, though. Um, and for me, the fines and fees work is just a perfect example of how um, important policy change and how a somewhat, you know, seemingly simple change in policy um, can really be transformative uh, in the ways in which government interacts with people. Um, so that's what you know, that's what really excited me, the chance to, and I feel like it's it's also just such a clear, um, like, an, a, like a, a reversal of the traditional way in which government has, you know, basically participated in creating and sustaining systemic racism. This is like literally reversing policies um, to try to undo uh, or stop doing some of that harm. Um, and I'll say, you know, for me in the, as the in the Office of Criminal Justice, while uh, we are not ourselves the court system or the prosecutor or law enforcement, we do work very closely with them and we do see um, on a daily basis how the imposition of fines and fees can have negative impacts on uh, on people's lives who come into the criminal justice system and can exacerbate um, a whole host of uh, the harms that Julia was talking about um, and, and in ways that, you know, people might not expect uh, when those fines and fees are, are being levied and that it can really follow people uh, throughout their lives. Um, and as, um, as someone who's really committed to um, reducing mass incarceration and in general, um, you know, reducing the the unnecessarily flow, unnecessary flow of people into the justice system, um, you know, eliminating and reducing fines and fees is a way to combat the cycle of uh, of those of those systems that we see in our city. So I guess I have to go to. <laughs> yeah, that's the first question. We may as well get an answer from everybody on the first oh. one. Okay, so uh, you know, I was hesitant and going because will you hear me on my soapbox all the time um, in the office? And so I was, I was trying to really spare you um, from yet another opportunity to hear me bang my drum. Um, you know, at the Office of Community Empowerment and Opportunity, it starts with community, right? And so we are driven by, informed by, inspired by community and its members. And I think this is a, a real opportunity to do work that you hear all the time from community members. Sometimes it's a different word choice. Sometimes it's a very different setting. Sometimes it's it's to the echo chamber of other sort of forgotten or um, marginalized folks who really don't have the tools or access to power or influence to do much about it. And so this is one of the rare times in my career that I can proudly say that Here's where my work, my personal experience as a black man living in America and the community in which I'm attached to and have heard these issues about predatory fines and fees that I'm actually doing something um, inspired and informed by them. 
Um, so I can be in the barbershop or at the event <laughs> um, in the old neighborhood or visiting relatives on and sitting on a stoop and say, you know, this is what's happening in your city on behalf of you and inspired by you. And I'm extremely proud to be a part of this work because of that. Thank you all for that. Um, that was that was fun for me, not just because um, uh, I think it gives a lot of uh, good and different perspectives for folks uh, who will be listening to this, but also just knowing uh, the three of you and seeing like the mix of sort of job description and personal um, energy that you bring to this work. Uh, each of you have been involved with us um, on this journey, um, and by us, I mean the, the group of folks who have been working on this for the last two years. Uh, and I'm wondering from your perspectives, uh, what's gone well, uh, what's been challenging, and in that, what's been surprising and what did you sort of expect? Um, you want me to start? Sure. Uh, I think what's gone well and also what may be surprising is, and this is not just about this work, and so this work has had some starts and stops. Um, well, you know, some folks have um, sort of rotated out of this work and we've brought on some new folks, some new members to the choir as the work has grown and sort of morphed. Um, but I think it's not just about this work, it's this moment in time, especially in the midst of COVID. Um, doing this work, you're uh, in the midst of COVID and all the work that we had to do to respond and support um, and mitigate all these really big issues um, affecting all of our communities, but most importantly, our marginalized communities. Um, the way in what folks you're reminded of how passionate and invested um, your co-workers are, your peers are, your colleagues are, how committed they are to making the city better um, and how much we are up to the challenge. Um, and I've seen folks risk personally and professionally um, and commit to doing things differently and standing on that as a real path forward. Um, so I, I was surprised by that and encouraged at the same time. Yeah, one thing I'll say about this work for Philadelphia that has been really exciting since the beginning is the kind of range of government partners that are are part of are part of fighting for this change. Um, you know, we're used to working with, you know, a small group of folks who are either operating the criminal justice system or who are doing anti-poverty work, but this really brings together a whole host of, of city partners who I identify and sort of understand why this is a priority and in doing so have been able to keep it a priority, right? Because um, we're at a time where, you know, the city is a experiencing a tremendous amount of, you know, uncertainty around the pandemic, you know, calls for transformation around racial justice and um, all of that can it has coalesced around our fines and fees reform and it's continued to stay front and center because we've been able to remind um, one another and our leadership that, um, you know, working on fines and fees is one of the ways that we need that we need to um, support our 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 community members and it's a kind of a critical change that we can make now uh, to to do something long lasting. Yeah, just to jump off what Rachel said about like people at the table from the beginning. I mean, we really did like to some extent this this work. I mean, it, it came together from, I think, a bunch of different things that were happening simultaneously, even pre-pandemic. But we, you know, we borrowed from the work of experts and advocates in the city who've been working on similar issues for years. Uh, but we also started with uh, a table that included um, our, our finance off our budget office from the beginning. And I think, Rachel, that's kind of what you were referencing, that that was really, I think, critical. It was, um, I think, propelled to the next level in part by the voices of people with lived experience and the survey that you all did of people um, in the prisons or uh, who you know who are um, returning returning residents or family members of of them, um, 
and we had the, you know, we also had, um, thank goodness, the mayor's voice on this um, early and clear uh, that this was a priority. Um, so yeah, I think all of those things um, were really important in, in allowing us to accomplish the things that we've done so far. And, you know, we definitely have more on our agenda, but for the progress that we were able to make during this difficult time, I think we have, you know, each of those um, players to thank. Yeah, and you know, Julia, jumping off of, of that, sort of going to this next question, I'm really interested in your perspective on this. So there has been this great group of, uh, you know, departments and, you know, individuals who have um, made this work move forward, whether it was budget, the mayor's office, uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion, Office of Criminal Justice, um, Managing Director's Office, um, and I and I do think that that group was really necessary to moving uh, this work forward. And you know, CEO, I I get worried about words like lead and champion, right? Because you know, depending on your role, that looks very different. But I think at the very least, we can say that you know, CEO was playing that role of like not letting it drop right if everybody got busy if everybody's priorities sort of like crowded the plate making sure there was space for this and making sure that you know we weren't going to you know let this be one of initiatives that died on the vine and so because of that sort of did some agenda setting and sort of did some messaging and you know certainly did that community work and so really led in that way and i'm wondering you know um every everybody on this call answers up to the mayor and answers up um, you know, to uh, him as, you know, the elected that we all work for. And this could have come from anywhere, right? It could have come out of budget. It could have come out of um, out of prisons. It could have come out of the Office of Criminal Justice. Was there something that CEO brought to the table that you think was unique in terms of playing that leadership role? Yeah, I, I definitely think so. Um, I mean, you know, Mitch talked about the community in community empowerment and opportunity so that you know that's definitely a piece of it and and i think you know frankly being a group of people ceo being a group of people who have thought deeply about poverty and um its far-reaching impacts and what it feels like in daily life um that that was really critical to um thinking about the problem um, and and making the case, frankly, for you know what sometimes might seem like small, you know, small dollar charges um, for really helping people understand um, sort of like the cascading effects um, that that you know something like a seventeen dollar balance on your account at the commissary um, can mean, um, or you know, not being able to call your family. Um, couple weeks in a row, what that does for um, family relations and what that, you know, the ripple effects that that can have. Um, and so I think, you know, in addition to the, um, to, to really the roots of the community, the deep, deep knowledge about um, multidimensional understanding of poverty and how it shows up in people's lives um, and, and, and um, why making a policy change like this can be so impactful. And I'll just echo what Julia said, you know, and then some, I, you know, I think that, that um, you, your, per, the perspective of a CEO um, is, is unique in many ways and is often that, um, it's often, you know, the kinds of considerations that are missing in justice system decision making, right? So the experiences of individual people how what seems like small small charges or small uh, constraints can actually have really large impacts on people's lives and how um, damaging that can really feel and be for people um, who are in the criminal justice system. And hearing that from someone who's not sort of constantly mired in the, the kind of um, justice reform and policy space has been really helpful because you bring a fresh take you are you know you are sort of I mean you're still part of city government but you're you're um slightly more removed from 
some of the other um, kind of uh, policy considerations. And in doing so, you've been able to be more singularly focused on this, which has been hugely beneficial, I think, to advancing the ball. Thank you for that. You beat me to my question, which, um, you know, given your role at a lot of these criminal justice reform tables, you know, uh, CEO, which for those of us who, uh, those of you who will be listening, we keep using that acronym. That's the Office of Community Empowerment and Opportunity. Um, but, you know, you, um, you know, you have that perspective of CEO not being a usual suspect in those conversations. And so, yeah, thanks for sharing that. And Mitch, I have sort of the same question for you tailored a little bit differently. As the executive director of the agency that was playing this role of making sure there was room on the plate for this priority, whether it was in a budget conversation, whether it was just getting time on people's calendars, getting people's attention to this issue, um, how do you think coming from CEO was helpful to doing that versus if you had been, you know, coming from another chair? Um, I think that one, you know, personally speaking, you know, I'm a social worker and so, <laughs> you know, uh, understanding the power of incremental change um, <laughs> is super important um, and a way to be patient and a way to listen and not judge, I, I think, um, just in, in that approach and, um, and, and and really finding places and where there's opportunity for mutual wins, um, ultimately. And appeal to, you know, the the, the everyman aspect, the, the, the sort of good in folks um, and understanding folks that are quite often well-intentioned but just seeing something from just a slightly different perspective and we can just shift <laughs> just a little bit and provide a different vantage point, then they'll get there quite often on their own uh, with some support. So I, I, you know, so I think that sort of still guides my approach, that social work mentality. Um, but I also think that, you know, steeped in community action, right? This organization that, you know, was, sort of this work was sort of created about the federal government saying hey we need to act differently as a federal government uh we need wide and far-reaching reforms and and using the power that exists with us to initiate and instigate change on one level but at the same time authorize and empower um communities cities and states realize their set of priorities and, and get stuff done uh, to the betterment of their constituents. Um, and I think that, you know, trying to navigate these spaces and places of power, um, informal and formal, um, I think has been a, a real opportunity to, to sort of win here. Um, and, and also I think our experiencing collective impact as well has informed the way in which we think differently about uh, collaboration um, and, and partnership. And so luckily we had a set of partners who were willing and wanting to challenge systems and status quo and move towards institutional change. Yeah, and I, I love that you called out, you know, that collective impact work. I think some other ground laying work just within CEO, you know, to my mind was the uh, sort of whole family work that NCAP has done that we've, you know, certainly learned from. And, you know, once we could start to connect, you know, the impact of these small dollar fines and fees, not just to an individual, but to an individual's families and sort of like the broader impact it was having and not just monetary, but sort of like family system impact, um, I think was really intuitive for us when we saw it, but was intuitive because of that sort of whole family uh, approach that I think NCAP has started to, to nurture. Um, I think probably coming up on the last question, we'll see how this one goes, but I'm really interested um, to hear from each of you because I think a lot of folks who will be uh, listening in on this um, have different sort of local government, local ecosystems um, where if they wanted to start this work, join this work, they're going to be working with sort of 
either an elected office like you work in Julia or you know an office of criminal justice a court system a, a police department you know something like that that's close to what you work in Rachel and will certainly be coming out of a CAA so um, you know if there's a community action agency that wants cares about this in their community knows it's a problem doesn't know where to start what advice would each of you uh, give that individual or that organization So, I mean, I'll just start by saying, which we haven't talked about on this call, is that, you know, we were also inspired by what other places had done. Um, I mean, we 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 took a, I remember a couple of years ago, we took a specific set of reports from San Francisco and said, oh my God, look what they actually got done. Um, and that was really our, you know, playbook is, um, you know, probably we, we attempted, <laughs> um, but um, so I think, you know, bringing uh, and then later we were lucky enough to be able to join, you know, a formal cohort of other communities doing this work, which was super powerful. Um, and so, you know, I, I think starting with examples from elsewhere, just so people can understand that it is doable, um, is super helpful. Um, and and then you know finding champ you know we talked we started by talking about the champions of the work inside of government that we had like finding champions inside of government to bring those examples to <laughs> or maybe you you know you bring your examples and then you watch the reactions and that's how you figure out who the champions are um, but you know that's that was our path um, and and that's what I would you know that's what I would recommend to others. Um, and one thing I would also say is that um, as in addition to learning from other places, which is critically important, there is also kind of a unique set of structures and circumstances in every jurisdiction, particularly in the criminal justice system and the, the laws and, and structures that govern that. And so really spending time try, learn, understanding that and learning about that learning um, what the barriers are within both your, your, you know, your local court system, your state law, your state law infrastructure, um, and, and what advocacy has been done on that in your community already. Um, you know, we learned a lot from existing advocacy efforts in Philadelphia and people who have, um, you know, a long history of investigating what is and isn't possible in terms of fines and fees reform um, in, in Pennsylvania. And so I think that's critically important groundwork that would be needed in any jurisdiction. Yeah, I, I so appreciate those two answers. Um, for us at, at CEO, I think like if, if you want to sort of be the convener um, and, and try to be the glue that holds some of this together, it's it's labor intensive work. <laughs> I'm not going to BS you at all here. Um, and it's it's not just setting up the meeting, it's the hours and hours of work that happens in between time. Um, and so we'll learn that <laughs> really early. The hard on. way. The real hard <laughs> way. Like when he was filling out his time allocation forms, he's like, whoops, uh, might have misjudged how much time I'm going to be spending on this. Um, but change happens at the speed of trust quite often. And, and I think that um, to, to Rachel's point, the, the, the deeper you get in and understand uh, stuff at the granular level, you, you'll gain access not only to the folks that you look to move or change, but also those folks who've been doing it a long time, who trust you and include you as a part of the community and inform you and encourage you and support you in ways that you could never imagine um, at the starting point of taking on some of this work. And so we've had a tremendous level of support from our national partners and also locally. Um, and, and, and if you all are attached to government or work with government entities, quite often government is so afraid of connecting with the community. Oh, residents, ah, right. Um, or stakeholders or advocates, um, because sometimes we're often on, on opposite sides of an issue, um, but to be of government, and and to get support from the advocate community or grassroots organizations has been really um, such a joy and, and a treat. Um, and it makes you feel like you're on the right road. 
you're doing something right. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. And I think I would wrap it up uh, there because, I mean, I think the one of the takeaways from all of your answers to that last question is, you know, the, the need to do the hard work, right, to like give people something that they is a value add for them. And whether that's inside of government, being able to say to, uh, you know, your leaders and your elected, you know, this is something that sort of moved the ball forward for you, either from an agenda or constituent perspective. Um, and it's well proven from, you know, all of this outside work we've done, or whether it's from inside government out to advocates and being that like genuine voice or that genuine connection point for them where they actually not only feel like they're being heard, but they're actually being heard and their message is getting back over um, to folks who make decisions. Um, I think I think the key is, is that I know we at CEO certainly got a lot from all of that engagement, but the hard work to me is actually being a value add out to all of those, um, to all of those different constituents. And uh, so it's nice to hear that show up in some of your answers. I thank you all again for your time. Um, we're gonna we're gonna cut away from this to a Q and A uh, with Mitch and I that'll be live. Uh, but thank you to Rachel and Julia for taking time out, um, and you know for two years worth of support and you know more to come um, as we advance this work in Philadelphia. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you.